Hey everyone, welcome to Let's Pod This. My name is Andy Moore, I'm one of your hosts, and this is the episode where everything that can go wrong has gone wrong, except for last week where our microphones didn't work. Uh, Welcome to the show. I'm joined as always by Scott Melson. Hello, sir. What's up, dude? We'll skip the fact that we just all did this already and I hadn't hit record yet. So Let's pod this take two. Take two. It's it's just another day in paradise. It's because we're recording on a different day. Yeah. We'll blame that. And the rain. It's the rainy season. The oh. monsoons. Mercury in retrograde. Did you hear that? Our, equi- our equipment is sensitive to moisture, so please sponsor the pod so we can get better. No. <laughs> This is like our fourth iteration of stuff. But if we had that uh, external doodad, yeah. the uh, Zoom H6 recorder, we'd be in business. That's what we need, guys, an external doodad. That's right. Every week, Scott and I text it to each other. It's on sale. We still don't have the money, but we want it. Um, will our wives be mad if we spend the money on this? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what about all the microphones? Um, just to be clear, that impression was of neither of our wives yeah. that was a fictitious person <laughs> mine would be uh what is this 500 hundred dollar charge to random electronic store <laughs> right. I, I, I don't know it must it, we were hacked heart heart monitor yeah medical things it's for work it's a it's a v-fib is that a thing is uh, that a state of a state of being um kind of it's a state of being that exists for about 90 seconds before death okay that's, what, <laughs> that's where the podcast is right <laughs> yeah. Yeah. if you're in, if you're in if you're in vfib and you don't fix that you are not long for this world we should fix that well the other uh, laughter you hear in your ears is uh, representative and candidate for lieutenant governor leslie osborne hello she's not running for lieutenant governor dude i know dang it <laughs> really everything's going wrong wow i'm sorry Labor commissioner. There we go. Wide this all right. goes back to another conversation we had about <laughs> offices that people should run for. Indeed. Perhaps. So, well, anyway, Leslie, hello. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Um, and don't be afraid to get close to that mic. Okay. I can also adjust. Um, all right. Super. So, um, this week, a couple of quick announcements. We'll start like we always do. Um, thanks, everyone, who came to our Capital Restoration Project Tour. Scott, you went on the tour last week. Dude, it was so awesome. Did you it like was, it? It was so awesome. I mean, I was like nerding out hardcore. The part of me that loves old buildings was nerding out. The part of me that thought I wanted to be an engineer and loves like big buildings and like systems and electrical stuff and plumbing stuff, that part of me was nerding out. My patriotic Oklahoman was nerding out. Um, and then the part of me that likes mountains and heights and climbing and pictures was nerding out that I got to take a selfie with the dome. That's right. <laughs> How many people can say they took a domi? A, do- a domi. Right. <laughs> There's not many people that took a legit domi, but I'm one of them. Right. Leslie, have you toured the project? I have. And you know, um, it really is something that needed to be done. Yeah. You know, the first four or five years I was in the legislature, we talked about, do we bond this? Do we do this? And there was so much worry from citizens that we only wanted to make ourselves palatial, fabulous offices. No, the building was falling down. But in the meantime, while it was falling down and there, you couldn't even buy parts for the air conditioner and heater, you had to actually manufacture them to, to the wiring, just a miracle of God that it hadn't burned the building down (laughs) to these kinds of things. Uh, at the meantime, if you're already doing this, take it back to its original splendor. You don't have to be opulent. A lot of it was hidden under sheetrock. Mm -hmm. And just some of the things they found back to statehood are fabulous. So it's it's truly the people's house. Kids need to start going there on field trips again when it's completed. That used to be when my kids were little. You saw so many groups. We didn't see many the last few years because it wasn't really the show place it should have been. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's it's something people need to see. I I totally agree. And I mean, and I'll, I'll tell you from my my perspective too there's definitely like a you know there's kind of a you get like when you talk about cost of these things that's like you get what you pay for i mean this is expensive i mean i think trey thompson told us it's like a total of like 249 million in Mm -hmm. bond issues Mm -hmm. which is a lot of money but it's one it's being well spent and the work that they are doing is incredible like they are i mean this is not like this is not a like a uh, modular like order it online and put it together when it gets there kind of like they are going through they are repairing they are repairing the facade literally stone by stone with master masons from all over the country um, the paint mock-ups that we saw uh, on the lower floors are incredible going back to the original color the plaster I mean it's just it's it's being done really really well and in a way that I think should should last it also is an example 
of when you don't practice stewardship, what happens? And for years and years and years, many of these things had needed to be upgraded or fixed, which wouldn't have taken that kind of price tag. Sure. But it wasn't a sexy vote. It was sexier to give a pay raise here or to do a road project here, and we let the stewardship fall down. But that's part of being a legislator. State property is is something you need to take care of and we didn't and we need to remember that in the future and not let things fall down before we start working on them you heard it here from the former house appropriations and budget committee chairwoman all right so just mark that down i too am not a sexy vote <laughs> <laughs> it's um but and i if you'll send me your pictures i'll take yeah with my pictures and i'll put them on the blog post for sure. this episode um as a as a as an update because i toured it first a year ago from the day that we went on friday and it was amazing to see how much progress they'd made in the year. And, and Trey, who's the project manager and a friend of the pod, uh, said that he's just now feeling like they're actually making progress. Yeah. And it's they're three years into it, I think. Um, and it'll be done completely in 2022, I think, or 2024. They've got a lot to do. So that $250 million is spread out over like 10 years yeah. because there's a lot of a lot of parts to the capital. Well, I mean, like the uh, the very bottom level, what was previously, I like how Trade said, referred to as the basement, but now is going to be the first floor. Ground floor. Ground yes. floor where there's going to be a massive like visitor entrance. So they had to pour all new slab down there. Oh, yeah. But to pour the new slab and run new conduit for electrical and plumbing and piping and all these sorts of things, they had to rip out the old slab. Which, you know, a lot of times you would do with like big machinery, like you do with a backhoe or like another kind of earth mover. Right, right. Well, there's not a way to get those down into the ground basement full of the Capitol. So they knocked it out with jackhammers and wheeled it out one wheelbarrow at a time. They said, I mean, he'd have like, they said we'd have 50, 60 guys at a time just going back and forth. And I asked us to an elevator and then having to ride the elevator yeah. up and then go out the building. <laughs> so do you have an estimate on how much material? And he, his eyes got really wide and he kind of spaced out for a second. I was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure someone could figure it out. Yeah. But it, but it was a lot. Yeah. He's so it, and trade has done a fabulous job. I remember when they first hired him and people said, is this his field of expertise? Well, he know he was pretty young. He's done a great job. We have a good system of checks and balances of legislators to uh, citizens that are on different boards for checks and balances on spending and making sure things don't ever go over what was approved by the by the uh, legislature. It's been he's done a fabulous job. And yeah, and two things on that. One, uh, if you're a listener and you're worried about who's choosing the colors, it's not trait. Um, mm -hmm. It is a committee that chooses colors, right. and that sounds like a terrible idea, but so far, they've done a really great job. They mm -hmm. do, as, as Scott mentioned, mock up what it looks like, like what a corridor will look like in a, in a full-size thing, not just, not like us, where we just tape the paint swat to the right. to the wall. Yeah, they actually looks pretty close. Yeah, it looks fine. Um, they're actually painting the whole thing, putting the stone in, looking at it for like a week, and they're like, okay, no, let's go a little bit lighter, and they fix that and after three or four iterations they've decided on what they're using well and it's not even as simple as to say that they're like deciding because the way they even get to what colors they're using right right they've gone away they've taken down the old plaster they've taken down drywall they've literally looked at like x-rays they've taken paint chips yeah. they're doing like gas chromatography <laughs> on these yeah. on these samples to try and do the very best they can to match the exact color at the time of construction to do just like what leslie was saying to return the building to mm -hmm you know, as close as possible to the state that it was in when it was first constructed. Right. It's not the Taj Mahal. I mean, this is just the, this is the Oklahoma state capital. It's nice. It is the the largest tourist attraction in the state. Which okay. is shocking to me, actually. Yeah. Because I would think that the bombing... I mean, in a couple I think, of ways. I would think, yeah. And I think, I mean, <laughs> and I would think the, that the bombing memorial would be number one, but I guess it still is not. And it doesn't even have a scissor tail on it. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> You know, it's interesting. You said that, like, you know, kids used to come to the state capitol mm -hmm. for a field trip. So we did not do that when I was like in elementary school or junior high. And if we, I mean, if we did, I don't remember. So it was underwhelming. Um, but when I was in elementary school, there was one field trip that everybody went on in the fifth grade, and it was that you would go to see the symphony. So you went to see the Oklahoma City Philharmonic. Really? Black. I was going to guess Frontier City. No, it was every year. That, so all the, it was like, and it was like the same day. Like all the fifth grade classes in the state right. went. I did not get to go. I'm shocked by that. Uh, why are you shocked? Because you're a big Broadway fan. Oh, yes, that's true. <laughs> Do you know, you know why? You know why I didn't get to go? No, because I was scheduled to go to the Oklahoma City Philharmonic on April 19th, 1995. Wow. Interesting. That was the day that all the 
middle, like all the fifth graders in Oklahoma, I know Oklahoma City, but maybe like all over the state, were supposed to be downtown at the Civic Center to, see the, to see the Philharmonic. And they like, we were getting ready to get on the buses. And they're like, no, we're not going. And no, no one would tell us what was going on hmm. until we got wow. home from school and talked wow. to our parents. Yeah. Interesting. I started to, started to like bring it down super yeah. morbid yeah. there. No, that, well, that's interesting. The bombing has come up twice in my day today, which is unexpected. Um, this is the second time. And so it's funny how events like that, mm -hmm. that shape who we are, just suddenly pop up on an yeah. idle Wednesday, right? Yeah. All right. Well, um, so Shall we talk about the labor department. So Leslie, you're running for labor commissioner. Mm -hmm. Tell us why. So there's a couple of reasons. I love the mission. The mission of the Department of Labor is safety, safety of citizens, safety of workforce. And why do I care as a sitting legislator and, um, and what do I think makes me qualified, I think is a good question. When I heard that Melissa Houston was not going to run, who, by the way, has been a fabulous labor commissioner, we've got a very well-run Department of Labor, about 80 employees, about an $8 million budget. It's one of our true shining examples of how state agencies should work. Uh, I was approached by several people that asked me if I would be interested. You know, I had two more years. I could have run one last term for the House of Representatives. Uh, but then this opportunity would have been gone, so big decision. But I had worked with uh, several labor commissioners on legislation in that area. So one of the things that I did was I was uh, approached by the compressed natural gas industry about five years ago hmm. about making a modicum of regulation for people that do conversions on compressed natural gas vehicles. The natural fit would have been to put this over at CorpCom, but at that time, this is when injection wells and earthquakes and everything were starting to happen. They were overloaded and underfunded. Uh, the Department of Labor was willing to take on this, and so I did a lot of interaction with them and loved what they did in that we set up a, ba a bare minimum of, of regulation where you have to have you know at least a 10, 10 day course at a career tech because you're basically handling a missile that you're putting in the back of mom's right, minivan right. yeah you have to you know and you have to know that you can only use an epa certified kit prior to this we had people on craigslist saying bring you know bring the van over and we can do this we people, used, people were literally doing yes, it like in their garage which at was home. not really? yeah. safe and people say why do we have licenses and regulation there's always the fine line between keeping the safety of your citizens and letting the free markets rule somewhere in the middle is the proper thing and i don't believe in blanket approaches where you say we should have no license in the state or everybody should license you work with each individual industry you don't want licensure to be an impediment to free markets or to say people that are in justice reinvestment coming out of prison but on the other hand, you don't want somebody that got out of jail for embezzlement last year handling grandma's closing fund at a title company. Right. Sure. There are certain checks and balances, and they need to be different and according to each one. The Department of Labor was beautiful about reaching out to all the industry, multiple meetings of coming in, tell us what is too much, what's enough. And it was one that was well received and done. So that being said, with my 10 years of experience in the legislature, having worked with them, having written their budget as an AMB chair, hmm. and the main people they interface with are small businesses in all 77 counties, my prior experience before I came into the legislature, I owned my own business in Total Oklahoma for 22 years selling heavy-duty truck parts, Osborne pickup accessories. That is maybe my favorite part of your bio. Hey, I need a new uh, bully bar from our bull bar from my Outback. So if you've got so a line you know on what, that. Okay, so if anyone knows what a <laughs> I don't group, think that's a heavy truck equipment, dude. No. When I tell that, I always get snickers and I say, listen, women didn't always sell Avon. I grew up on a farm business degree and found a product nobody was selling in Oklahoma. You could not buy back then a big black pipe grill guard to put on the front of your truck. You only had chrome ones being sold everywhere in the state. Not one person in this state was selling them. Well, if you hit something with the chrome grill guard of deer going down the yeah. road, you've just totaled your truck. Right. If you have on one of these ranch hand grill guards, it bounces off and you keep going. Uh -huh. So it was not just, it was a safety issue. Sure. It was a property stewardship issue. 
ended up having 25 dealers across the state, sold wholesale and retail, sold the business six years ago. But Department of Labor interfaces with small businesses. So there just seemed to be several areas where it seems like I would be able to, from working with this agency in the background, to be able to step on and start on day one. So I think you did a fantastic job of kind of talking about how you find, you know, you have to reach out to all the stakeholders, right? And that there's this balance between, you know, you know, regulating in a way that makes sense, but not so much that it becomes burdensome. Right. Talking about the labor department specifically and your experience as a business owner, but as also as a legislator and potentially labor commissioner, how do you find the balance between like management and ownership and then labor, like employees themselves? If you've got an industry where, you know, I don't know, you make widgets and all the, the owners of all the companies that make widgets say, well, we really feel like this is how regulation should look. But, you know, the 10,000 widget employees that work for them feel like it it needs to look different. How do you strike that balance? And this is a good question and I think a very relevant question. So we a lot of times hear people that think that the Department of Labor should only be for the businesses. They should be for the, the laborers, bus- not the laborers. Right. On the, this would be traditionally you're further to the right Republicans. Sure. Okay. We're here for business. Uh, they're going to take care of their employees. That's not something we need to worry about. But what we do need to make sure is we're keeping those businesses strong. Then on the other hand, you could have a further to the left person running for this or somebody in there that would say this is all about workforce. The demands of workforce. Yes, we're a right to work state now, but we need to make sure we're on hour and labor and our wage division and these types of things, but we aren't thinking at all about things that the business needs to keep going to employ those people. I, in my entire career, have hoped if I've done anything, I've been able to look at both sides. I'm rather known for being blunt, honest, and bipartisan. I think the biggest problem, and I'm going to go off just a second here, the biggest problem (laughs) facing Oklahoma and America in politics is people that live in their own bubbles. So the far right friends I have that will do nothing but listen to Fox News and the far left friends I have that will do nothing but listen to MSNBC and they refuse to interface, they don't believe in civil discourse and they don't want compromise because they are right and they have never listened to the other side. That is the problem. And until we put people in office and people running agencies and people that are making decisions for us that will listen to both sides work together nothing changes so it's really just a kind of like talk to you know it's just like what you're saying so you would talk to you talk to management you talk to employees and you say here's what they want here's what they want what's kind of the what's the middle ground here exactly you mentioned right to work and just in case you know that's something i want to say that passed in oklahoma like 15 years ago it was before i came into the legislature yes and it's Um, it's constitutional we have that so could you just for for anybody who's listening and is like what are they talking about could you kind of do two things one explain what right to work is and two what are your what are your thoughts how do you feel about right to work and do you feel like it's been good bad and different how does what is right to work what do you think first of all most people when you tell them you are going to run for department of labor think that that's all you're going to do they assume rightly so by looking at the moniker that these are people that deal with nothing but labor issues sure that being said the wage and hour division is a tiny very underutilized probably part of the department of labor when right to work passed and before I was ever in. I remember the years when Keating used to give his speeches and there would be a whole uh, consortium of people shouting about right Right, to work, for it or against it, kind of like when Scott Walker in Wisconsin and all that. We, everything was very divisive as far as union labor versus non-union. That's really not an issue. And to be honest, it's not anything that's dealt with. Okay. At the Department of Labor anymore. There is a wage and hour division. There is a child labor division. But the vast, vast, vast majority is safety issues for employees, free programs that go out to every business, public and private, all 77 counties, and offer free consultation services, keep your employees safe. That's where you work with the employees. Okay. But number two, it also helps the businesses because they're going to get lower comp rates because they are doing everything to keep their businesses safe. And recently, the governor tasked with an executive order, Workforce Development, over to the Department of Labor, which is where it needs to be. 
I've already visited with Marcy Mack, the head of career tech, Joy Hoffmeister, the head of education, about a collaboration with the three. We have beautiful jobs we've created, for instance, in the aerospace industry. When I came into the legislature 10 years ago, oil and gas number one job provider, ag number two, agriculture. Now agriculture's number three, aerospace is the number two provider of jobs in the state because of those tax credits. For, for every dollar we spend, we get eight in return. It's our most successful tax solid. credit. And someone just announced this week that they're coming to yeah, a right? whole new company. Like, yeah. three, like 357 yeah, high tech jobs? Like a legitimate, I was, it wasn't just like, hey, 12 guys are gonna yeah. build no. model airplanes. Like it was a real. It is serious and it works. What we need to be doing is watching for the next niche market we can find and have an equally successful those kind of tax credits are the ones you keep there working but here's the problem i went to nordam in tulsa our biggest aerospace provider of jobs aren't they in they, the middle of it did they, they just file they did do that but they're still highly <laughs> successful it was a reorganization because of a partnership okay. with a canadian firm okay so ah, those that, canucks uh, but that being dude said, i love me some canadians um, they have a fabulous family-run business there. I go to them. I said, how's this working for you? Because I ran the bill this year to, to extend the aerospace tax credit. And they said, fabulously. We just got a billion-dollar contract with um, Airbus. We're doing all these things, but we have one problem. We're hiring all these new people. They're not Oklahomans. Why? Because we're not training our kids to take those jobs. We let kids graduate from high school and decide what they want to do. We need to be targeting kids that are good in STEM in junior high with the collaboration of Career Tech, Common Ed, and the Department of Labor working with workforce development. The kids that are good in science and math then be educating them that if you go to a Career Tech, you can start out at fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year right here in Oklahoma with an aerospace job. If you go to OU or OSU Engineering, top half of your class, you are guaranteed an internship and starting at one twenty. Good golly. And what are we doing? We're letting kids graduate and, and just go into any degree. We also have fabulous apprenticeships for other things. We got to work on our workforce. That's how you keep your kids here. No, I totally agree. Do you have a, this is this is on. It's going to sound like a sidetrack, but it's not. You guys watch. You guys watch this old house. Like well, we, I used to like a hundred years ago. Okay, Bob Vila, and now is with, it still on? Oh, it's oh, it's still on, and it's I, awesome. I watch no Chip one. and Joanna now. Okay, so. well, right, yeah, also yeah. great show, great show. So this old house is still on. Uh, airs week airs uh, weekly. There's yeah. two new seasons a year. Bob Vila is no longer no, associated Norm, with it. Um, yeah, it's Norm. Yeah, okay. uh, Sil- uh, well, Norm is the carpenter. Tom Silva is the general contractor. Oh, right, 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 right. Um, there's a guy named uh, Kevin Kevin O'Connor is the host. But anyway, um, so they're actually the reason I bring this up is because they are doing this uh, most recent season they are having apprentices for every single one of their like master craftsmen oh, nice. they're doing they're kind of sponsoring and trying to bring awareness to a nationwide initiative trying to encourage young people to go into the building trades mm-hmm. um and it's i think that's i think you bring up a fantastic point that we hear so much about stem because it's vital but i think people hear stem and they think that that means you have to go to a four-year college and you have to major in engineering yeah. or biotech mm-hmm. or that you don't stem or that you're only going to be a high-tech engineer right there are many jobs in stem that go into very uh, different facets and yeah. many different kinds of businesses right, right. and well i'm gonna just connect to this but you know in college uh, one of my roommates was a, a fabulous trim carpenter he was about uh, 10 years older than me and the the poor guy couldn't manage his checkbook to save his life but he made beautiful cabinets and trim um and i'd learned a ton from him for a while we had a like a 900 square foot shop attached to our house so i just built cabinets all the time as it turns out that's a really handy skill to have and i've built some bookcases in our new house um but i every time i do it i'm like man it's a lot of a lot of math and angles right oh yeah and since the america never switched the metric system that math is difficult when you're it's like seven sixteenths right plus Four eights or whatever. Well, and you mentioned Norm Abrams, who's the who's the uh, master. Yeah. He's the master carpenter in this old house. Norm Abrams is essentially a self-taught carpenter mm-hmm. who has a uh, undergraduate degree in uh, mechanical engineering, um, mm. and then found out he liked building cabinets more, and right, so right. built this hugely successful career doing that. But I think workforce development is 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 huge, uh, and I think. I don't know. I mean, I I don't know the ins and outs of the budget the way that you that you would, but it seems like it's something that we 
we need to be investing much more in than we have. And that natural collaboration of career tech and common ed with the Department of Labor, I think it could be a game changer. So I will go to a lot of these candidate forums and I hear the the, uh, lieutenant governor candidates speak. It's all about bringing in new jobs and new industry. Absolutely, we need that. But number two, what about the ones that are here? The ones that are here in all 77 counties, let's do everything we can to keep them safe, to get them a workforce, to make sure their licenses are not onerous, that they're that they're done properly. I visited with the electricians trades, with the uh, with the um, plumbers and pipe fitters. A lot of theirs, they would like to see some reform. They would like to really partner more with every career tech, teaching these kids that are good in FFA. They're good in ag. A lot of these kids that may not be going to a four-year college, do you realize you can come straight out do a journeyman, be an apprentice. It's fabulous sure. careers. We are letting these kids go work at Quick Trip. And there's right. nothing wrong with working at Quick Trip. But sure. my point is our kids are our future. Nothing changes till we educate them the best way possible. Keep building these jobs and our kids fill them. That's exciting. Yeah. That's why I want to be your next labor commissioner. Oh, that's, I, I mean, you've... You've inspired me. I, I mean, I, I'll make no bones about that. You know, one thing that came up at the debate a little bit, and I wonder if you could talk about it a little bit more, was this idea, and you've mentioned it, of licensing. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is, I think, Governor Fallon, was it an executive order yep. where she has kind of directed like a commission to figure out how we can consolidate Mm -hmm. licensure. Is that an accurate way to to put it? There was potential legislation that did not make it through this year on the actual consolidation. But what she did do by, by that has been enacted was there was no database in the state that showed what every trade and that required a license there was no central database that has now been completed by commissioner houston you can pull it up on the department of labor website every single license and a lot of them go into sub licenses and Mm -hmm. things like plumbing to electrical but it's really interesting to see now that we have that database the legislature passed a bill this year with Senator Adam Pugh and uh, Representative Mike Osborne. And what they will be doing is looking at recommendations. Are some of these an impediment to work to the free markets that we really is a hair braider? Sure. Someone that we care if they had a felony 22 years ago. Sure. Probably not. But a hairdresser, maybe because they're putting chemicals on your scalp. Right. If you're like me and we don't want to know what color your hair is, so you go every six weeks and you never know, ignorance is bliss. And But on the other hand, like I said, the, uh, the thing earlier about an embezzler, we probably don't want them in something that's in charge of um, abstracting and titles and that type sure. of thing. So there are reasons, but that's where you've got to work. The one bill that I saw that didn't go through this year was to get rid of every separate board and have one master board. Right. That worries me. I'm going to be honest, and here's why. I'm going to give you an example. The Department of Dentistry, it's a non-appropriated agency, has 12 board members, non-paid dentists from every area of the state. They know how long tools should bake in an autoclave. They know about safety standards for dentistry. They know the difference in do you need what kind of tech in there if you're doing oral surgery. But somebody that also is doing electrical at the Devon Tower doesn't. If you have one master board... Without people in those specific type things, are we going to have the right oversight? Uh, that worries me a little. Sure. Nobody is an expert in everything. And right. I don't I don't have a problem with a board having a field of expertise. Right. But you can't be experts in everything. But you can't be. So if you have your individual boards, and they're not even paid. So a lot of these, you'll hear like gubernatorial candidates say, oh, we have 32,000, you know, agents. Right. Okay, no. We have 67 that are appropriated. Right. That's, that's the number you need to remember. We had 85 when I came in. That's how many we've eliminated, streamlined, consolidated public-private partnership. But a lot of those, like say the dental board, right? They have they 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 take no taxpayer dollars. It's all on fees and fines. It's working. They have their own uh, right. experts. The the it's rotating board members. If there's a problem with one, they're removed. What's wrong with that? Right. And do we want to call that big government or do we want to call that efficient for that industry? Sure. I think I would say like for me as a, as a licensed uh, professional counselor, where there's the behavioral, uh, behavioral health board, board of behavioral health that monitors LPCs and LMFTs and LBPs. No one knows what that is. And um, I think they do a great job. They mm-hmm. used to be part of the Department of Health and they spun out several years ago into their own quote agency. But all the, you know, all of our fees, our licensure fees we pay go to them and it pays the salaries of the like three and a half right. employees they have that just But they understand what you do. Right. 
They yeah. know your purview. What right. if you had somebody that was also trying to worry about roofing? Right. And somebody else that <laughs> was a roofer, worried about, I about, understand that. <laughs> about somebody that was a crop duster. Right, okay. right. The, the, we're not paying any money with taxpayer dollars to that board. So what is the problem with letting them have that purview? Now, right. you need checks and balances. You want to make sure. sure that you don't have protectionism or something. Oh, going sure. Some age. Right. But the vast majority are working. Let's just look at the licenses and make sure they're not onerous. Sure. And you bring up the, the point about you know the, the funding and where the funding comes from. So most of these boards, they, that whatever their funding comes from the licenses and fees that they exactly. administer, right? Mostly from their licensing fees. So for right. instance, with the dentist, every dentist every year has to take their continuing education. They pay a small fee. They get the two or three people that work for them. Mm -hmm. They monitor legislation to make sure nothing happens at the Capitol that is onerous to their purview. And it works pretty well. Not one dollar, but... There is purview from OMS, the uh, Management Enterprise Services Agency, just to be watching over them to make sure they're not right. doing anything. But if they're not taking taxpayer dollars, what's the problem with industry doing some of that self-regulation? And you right. see it yourself with the social work. Sure. And I and I think it's um, the point you made earlier makes sense that it. I think there are certain professions where it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Doctors, dentists, therapists, like people. Professionals. Where, professionals. Right. And, mm -hmm. and people where you can have. Lawyers. You can have like a, a devastating impact on someone's life, oh, right? But like, even, right. But let's go electricians. Yeah, sure. So you're you're yeah. you want live? You know, some people might say, "But electricians don't go to college." Well, first of all, a lot of them did. Right. They might have a business degree before they did that. Right. But second of all, that's also can be life threatening. Electricity. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and that's where I use the one example of hair of a not hairdresser of hair braider. Sure. There's going to be some out there that we've gone too far on. Sure. That are an impediment to people that might be able to come into the to a, a job, or you might have somebody that say, say if you had the plumbers that said no felony convictions, right? And they realize they're not getting enough pool. What if you worked with them and said, okay, would you consider no felony for five years but random drug tests? Right. I think. It's a win-win. Sure. Work with the industry to make sure you're getting enough workforce, but not doing protectionism. Right. Right. I, it just has to be, it can't be a blanket approach. It's what, more work, but you have to go individual. Wasn't there um, a proposal or a, I mean, it might even been a bill this year that would have taken all those. And this, maybe this Under was one right, master board. And, and then taken all the revenue and put it into GR. Yes. Nightmare. Yeah. Never. The, was that the same proposal or were those Lord, two separate things? I've been budget chair. Never send everything to GR. It's a black hole like in the in the atmosphere. Never do that. Just GR keep your separate pots of money, General man. revenue. Yeah, for general revenue. I just picture Scrooge McDuck when he like <laughs> swims in his money. Like. But because you said right now that there's, you know, there's umpteen, you know, thousand boards and commissions, but only 67 of them are appropriated. 67 agencies are appropriated. But this That's would mean. That's the number we need to remember. That would put all of them into more of a of appropriated agencies thing because we'd have to appropriate and dole money back out. Do we oh, really want to... And the, and the legislature is so great at appropriating money. <laughs> but the idea was is that you were shrinking government. No, no you no. are not. You're yeah. making it more complicated. Well, right. it, it feels like, and I'm just going to say this, and we've only got a couple of minutes left, but it really feels like because of some legitimate mismanagement like at the Department of Health yes. um, or tourism and these things recently, that the last year the legislature some members of the legislature have been like, you know what, screw it. Let's just bring it all back in house and we'll take care of it. And I'm like, hang on guys, just because they messed up doesn't mean you're going to do it better. One bad actor right. doesn't mean every agency is corrupt right. or doing it wrong. Also remember with the Department of Health, there were horrible fiscal decisions made. But For no, years. But nobody embezzled, nobody went no, to Europe, yeah. nobody did anything. What they were trying to do was as tax cuts were coming and as revenues were decreasing, <laughs> right. they were trying to keep community health centers open. Right. Now, I'm not saying what they did was right. In fact, some of it was probably actionable because there was actual federal dollar supplanting. But at the end of the day, they were desperately trying to keep their mission going. Now, that was the wrong way to do it. That's right. Well, Grant Herms at News 9 um, was trying to interview every state uh, agency head and ask, like, if you had all the money that you needed, how much would that be and what would that look like? And no one could even dream like that. And then he asked several of them, how many unfilled positions do you have? Like, they wouldn't really? say. And they didn't know because they... They kind of plan, like they've got like a, a bumper in there of like, well, you know, we've got like 50 unfilled positions that we can, that are just on the book so that they can be cut because they, they just, mm -hmm. because we're like a battered yeah. spouse. I mean, I hate yeah. to use that analogy, but like it's, 
it's or it's a the reality dog of or government. Something. I mean, it's something like you're right. kind of waiting for that. So, so that conversation, this kind of brings me to a question that I would like <laughs> to ask you, as a you know, former legislator, former A and B chair, and this goes back to a conversation that Andy and I have had on the pod and privately a lot. And we asked um, state auditor Gary Jones this a few weeks ago about this idea of like waste and a fraud and abuse and health department tourism. You know, I feel like all we've heard for the last, I mean, it's been a, a long time, but especially these last couple sessions is like, Oh my gosh, we don't need new taxes. There's all this waste in government spending. Mm-hmm. And we had auditor Jones on and he was like, one, I don't really think that's true. And two, we can audit any agency that we're asked to Mm -hmm. and the governor can ask us and speaker can ask us Mm -hmm. and the Senate, the pro tem can ask us and none of them ever have. (laughs) So (laughs) so, it's a diversionary tactic. And that's what I was going to ask you. Like, is this real? Like, is there really all this like wasteful spending that we just don't know about? So for someone that came in much further to the right, a rush baby who had all preconceived notions about government slowly morphed my way into the appropriations process and decided to truly spend months doing nothing but educating myself and how in the hell we got in this mess. How the year that I was budget chair did we have a $1.2 billion shortfall and truly discovered after making multiple charts and I love Excel and all those kind of things. uh, Aren't graphs amazing? I just, you know, it's a little type A, you know, and, uh, but the true numbers are, that 85% of our agencies have been cut an average of 45% in the last decade. That is astounding. Tell me, <laughs> in your own home budget, in your business, that was good, <laughs> that was professional. <laughs> if, if you've already cut 45%, do you think there's a lot of fat left? No. 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 If now, I lost 45% of me, I would be very, very thin. You're already thin. <laughs> well, that's what so, I'm saying. Yeah, it's a very thin. So my point is, are there tiny pockets somewhere of, that we need better efficiency? Absolutely. But remember that when I said 10 years ago we had 85 agencies down to 67, that many have been eliminated, streamlined, consolidated, public-private partnerships. We've cut that much. Now that we're showing some surplus, and it's temporary, we will refill the rainy day. Then we're going to have some money to invest. Don't grow government. Don't grow government. Sure. Take and put into four or five areas that change the trajectory of your future. Invest in prison programming so that we don't have constant recidivism. In every prison in this state, we should have mental health counseling, substance abuse counseling, job training, and GED attainment. Amen. That's how you don't keep doing the cycle. Put double Terry White's budget in mental health. Every dollar spent is $10 saved down the road in a life. Yeah. That changes our future. Invest in infrastructure. Businesses with better systems of infrastructure, businesses and industry want to be here. Invest in these pockets, healthcare access. Then you aren't 50th in everything. You are eventually 45th, 40th, 35th. You change your trajectory. That's what you do with the surplus. You don't cry because you got it and say, good Lord, we're horrible. We had too much money. You invest in pockets that change your future. I think we should end on that. Yeah. That was tremendous. Scott and I wholly agree. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Wouldn't it be great to not be fiftieth and all? Well, good then. On if you all wholly agree, even though I know at least one of you is a Democrat. (laughs) (laughs) What? Please feel free to show up and vote for Leslie Osborne for Labor Commissioner on August twenty eighth. Right. So August twenty eighth is the uh, the runoff runoff for the primary for the Republican primary. That's right. Um, Mm -hmm. So don't forget there are. I guess it's just runoffs. There's no statewide things on this no. ballot, right? No. Some local races, though. House races, too. That's it's true. Big ones. Yeah. It should be a big deal. Um, also, it's crazy that people are already starting to run for city council, and that mm-hmm. election's not until February. Yeah. So, uh, Leslie, thank you so much for being Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Yeah. This was great. I'd love to do it again. Oh, okay. we'd, lo- we'd love to have you back. And speaking of coming back, the announcement I was going to make early on, or the reminder, is that on the big election day in November, November 6th, right? I should know the date. Yes, it is November the 6th. 6th. Uh, on November 6th, we are having a huge election watch party at the Tower Theater from 6 to 10 p.m. It's going to be Scott we're, and We're I. saying it's 6 to 10, but really it's 6 to whenever it's done. Right. We, You and I very well may be on stage from 6 to 10. Yes. Or in some capacity. Um, so picture The Tonight Show or The Late Show with David Letterman. But better. But better. So <laughs> so imagine, imagine OETA's election coverage. Imagine uh, a, a really great... Wait, is, is one of you Paul? 
You no, no, Paul? we're trying to, we're trying to, we're trying to find that Paul. announcement's coming you out soon. You need a Paul. Yes. Okay. We do. So we're, we're gonna have a house band. Um, would you want to shake it up and have a female Paul? We might. Sure. So we're gonna have. I could be guests. a Polly. Are you, can you play an <laughs> instrument? No. Well, that doesn't work then. <laughs> <laughs> you just be like Andy Richter I over there. I can carry a boombox. There or we something. go. That's just <laughs> just hit the tape deck. <laughs> Let's see in the tape what deck. What you just did with that little change <laughs> there? Yeah, that's right. So we. um uh, so we're going to have a, a house band. Scott and I are going to co-host. We're going to have musical guests. We're going to have uh, interviewees. Uh, I love and, it. This is fun. And it's going to be, you know, there'll be a cash bar. We're going to have food. It's going to be a big party. Do we have a location? The Tower, Tower Theater, Theater on love 23rd. It. One love side it. will be red. One side will be blue. The food will be in the middle. So you've got to come to the middle. Shake Remember what I said about people in their bubbles. Right. Yeah, this we got to get people know, in the middle. We're bubble busters. <laughs> you know what we ought to do? We ought to not put the food in the middle. We ought to put half the food on each side <laughs> right. and make sure there's really good stuff on both sides. Right. So people have to. They, they have to integrate. They have right. to. Yes. So put the meat like on the Democrats and the veggies <laughs> on the Republicans so that they have right. to go Ooh, across. I like that. The meat on one side and the sauce on the other side. <laughs> right. Meat sauce. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're trying to get as many candidates to come by as yeah. possible and say hi. So if you are, hopefully, I'll still be a candidate, but I would be happy to come by either way. That'd be great. Um, and and if you're listening and you are a candidate for any office that's going to be uh, coming up in in November, and you want to have your watch party with us, we would love that. Um, I know that the parties host some kind of like party centric. Mm-hmm. Well, screw that. Come hang out with <laughs> us. Bring all your friends and your guests. You don't have to think about logistics. You don't have to worry about tablecloths. We're doing that for you. Just come. It is a fundraiser for us. It's free for people to come. Candidates, there may be a small charge um, for you to have like a little candidate table and area set up. But uh, hey, it's for a good cause. And it's going to be way cheaper than whatever you're going to put together in your mom's basement. I like it. <laughs> Make this shareable. I will absolutely That's help. right. It's, we will put it out there. Um, all right. So that brings us to the end of this episode. Don't forget... Oh, don't forget um, to subscribe and rate the pod on Apple Podcasts. We're also on Spotify now. What, what? Um, Scott is on Twitter at SC Melson. You can hit me up, Andy OKC. But us collectively is at Let's Fix This OK. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and the website, Let's Fix This OK.org. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter, read the blog. Um, we always post about the, the podcast afterwards with links that we would talk about. Um, pictures will be on this episode and uh, a link to Representative Osborne, Leslie Osborne's uh, campaign page as well in case you would like to find out more. Our podcast is edited and produced by Scott and me and Let's Pod This is a member of the Mostly Harmless Media Network. Our theme music is provided by the Sugar Free All-Stars who can't make it so they won't be our house band. Uh, but they're still good guys. Let's Fix This is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization who strives to educate and equip all Oklahomans to engage with their government. We encourage you to get out and be involved in any way you can. And remember, decisions are made by those who show up. Have a great week. <laughs> <laughs>